All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna start letting people filter in here. Um, we'll get started at half past. So we'll let people filter in for the next minute or two. All right, we've got folks filtering in. Um, still filtering in, but we're gonna get started. We are right at 11.30 Pacific, 12.30 Mountain. Can you do the math for everything else? Okay, cool. Wait for that number to flatten out. Okay, all right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to the Rainbow Ecoscience Plant Health Care Webinar Series. Um, we're here today. All right, so before we get started, we're gonna do a quick safety brief. Um, check your surroundings for any trip hazards, check your weather for any inclement weather that's coming towards you. And if you are driving, please make sure that you are just in listen mode only, no looking at screens um, or be parked in a safe location if you want to have access to those screens. Um, I'm Allison Harrell, I'll be moderating the questions and just here, I'm the arborologist for the West uh, based in Portland, Oregon. My contact information is there. And I think I know a lot of you folks from training and education, tech support, um, PHC and uh, troubleshooting, that sort of stuff. Um, I'm an arborist, pesticide applicator and have a background in biology and uh, urban forestry. Before we get started, this is the most important thing for those of you who are, who are here for CEUs. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, that's what we're going to use to moderate at the end for questions. The webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out. The webinar is worth one ISA CEU. So if you did not enter your ISA certification number during registration, please put that in the Q&A box now. And then chat would be used if you are like having any sort of technical issues. I also want to mention that Matt Karst is on here in the background. Um, so if he pops on, if something's going awry, just don't be surprised. That's my teammate, Matt. All right. So without further ado, we will get on to um, the presentation. So we have Dr. Seth Davis. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. He's going to be talking about life cycles, ecology, diagnostics, and management of common skill insects. And he is based in the front range, though there will be a couple of other skills that are uh, applicable to the West and the scale biology is applicable to the entire coast or country, sorry, the entire country, because um, basic scale, scale biology is uh, prevalent throughout the, the entirety of the world, really. So he is an assistant professor of forest entomology at Colorado State University. He's the PI of forest health at Colorado State, specializes in insect chemical, microbial, and behavioral ecology. He has his BS, MS, and PhD from Northern Arizona University, and his current interests are in vector biology, plant chemical uh, phenotypes, bark beetle symbiosis, pollinator biodiversity. Um, he's involved with a variety of basic applied research projects, extension activities, as well as consulting with government and private industry professionals. Um, and I think we are also welcoming several of Seth Davis's, Dr. Seth Davis's students. So welcome uh, here as well. And go ahead and take the screen now. Great, thanks, Allison. Um, let's see now if I can get it right this time. Okay. Okay. Is my uh, my presentation up correctly here? Good. Presentation is up. Looks good, and your volume is good. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, associate professor now, but I have you know I have so little but my title, so I'll like throw that in there. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about the common scale insects in the Western US and um, a variety of aspects related to their biology, life cycle and control in the hopes that it will help you all uh, to better recognize scale insects and to do a better job at managing them when you see them. So um, let's get started. Okay, 
Okay, good. So outline of the talk, uh, we'll talk about the basic taxonomy and ecology and the life cycle of scales, just so you understand what they're doing. Uh, some of the common scale pest insects in my region, although the ones that I'm gonna be talking about, the three examples that I'll give are also very common throughout the Western United States uh, and throughout the four corner states, but they're um, sort of big issues in Colorado as well. And then we'll talk about some of the basic uh, options for scale control, including things like natural control, biological control, chemical control, and, uh, and cultural control. So what is a scale insect? Uh, these are herbivorous, plant-feeding, uh, sap-sucking insects in the order of the, tr the true bugs, the hemipterans. So that is a very biodiverse group and contains about 50 to 80,000 species, depending on uh, who you ask and what day it is. These scales are closely related to a variety of other plant, plant pests, including aphids, uh, phylloxera, uh, plant hoppers, and, and others. So this group, the coxoidea, which is where the scales are taxonomically, uh, first arose about 50 million years ago during the Triassic period. So um, as far as insects go, they're relatively new in the sense that uh, insects first evolved about 330 million years ago. So um, here's the position of the coxoidea and their relation to a couple of other closely related um, taxa in the Sternorhynchia clade. So Sternorhynchia, this is a picture of an aphid, not a scale, but actually refers to the, re the rearward facing position of the mouth parts relative to the head. So rather than the feeding stylet facing straight out, it actually faces backwards, which has uh, some, some bearing on their feeding behavior. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So true bugs, including the scales and hemipterans are, are hemimetabulous. And that means that they don't go through complete metamorphosis. So here's an example of what that looks like. So scales uh, are born from eggs and then go through a series of nymphal instars. So in each successive molt, the body just grows larger, but they don't actually go through this pupil stage to completely change um, uh, life form from caterpillar to adult, for example, is with a uh, whole metabolism. So scales have a number of uh, larval instars. It differs between males and females, and you'll see why that is uh, before very long. But the stage we're gonna talk about first is this crawler stage. So that's the first uh, nymphal stage after hatching. And what's important about this crawler stage is it's the primary time that scales are uh, dispersing within the body of their host plant. So for the vast majority of their life cycle, they're relatively immobile, if not completely immobile. Um, and here you can see the crawlers dispersing along a branch along next to uh, an adult oyster shell scale. And they're extremely tiny at this stage and difficult to see, um, but this is a very important stage for control because it's when they're the most vulnerable to a number of uh, predators, um, as well as chemical controls, and oftentimes adults can be relatively resistant. Here's another example of a whole bunch of life stages all present on a single leaf from adults uh, to crawlers to eggs, all sort of overlapping in space and time on the body of the host plant. So these crawlers are one, one of the things that we're going to be concerned with sampling uh, and monitoring for knowing when these crawler stages are occurring and then applying the correct control applications when the crawlers are actually present. Uh, so again, just a brief recap of uh, their basic life cycle, essentially um, just going through a set of nymphal instars. Females typically have three instars from egg to sexual maturity. Males typically have five, and that's because for uh, a variety of scale species, the males may be the more mobile sex uh, and so can become either winged adults and fly away, which takes a little bit longer to develop, or they're sessile and feed on the body of the host plant uh, as well. So we'll look at that in a moment. Um, 
So as far as the diversity of sap sucking insects goes, Coxoidea and the scales are one of the most abundant variable groups in with this life history. They can cause extreme damage to agricultural plants, uh, but they also have a lot of importance in forestry and can build up substantial populations, uh, particularly in plantations that may require control and can result in the loss of economic timber uh, value. And in other cases, scales can even be used as control agents of invasive plants. So a good example of this is with Opuntia cacti, prickly pear cacti, uh, which are native to the southwestern United States, but in other parts of the world, such as Australia and South Africa, are highly invasive. They do very well there and completely outcompete native plant populations. Uh, some of the scales that feed on those cacti, like the cochineal scale, are used as biocontrol agents of, um, of, of these invasive plants and other habitats. So not always a pest insect. In some instances, they have um, a value for ecosystem management as well. So there's seven families that we're going to be concerned with that are important to forestry in Western North America. Uh, including the Astrolocaneidae, the pit scales, the Paxidae, soft scales, Diaspididae, armored scales, the Areococcidae, the felt scales, Margarodidae, the Margarodid scales, Pseudococcidae, mealybugs, and Kermesidae, the Kermes scales. I've highlighted in orange here um, sort of the two most important in pest management, the Coccididae the coccidae, the soft scales, and the diaspididae, the armored scales. And that's really what we're gonna focus on today is distinguishing between these two types of scales, uh, their life histories and their, their control options. Uh, so what, what is a scale? It, it refers really to the protective covering that uh, obscures the body of the insect itself, which can make it difficult to see uh, it can make it difficult to predate and it can make them difficult to control. So you can just see from this image, uh, there's, there's a variety of appearances of scales. Here is a tortoise shell scale. Uh, so you can see why it's named that because its scale looks like a tortoise. Um, San Jose scales uh, that have a variety of different type of uh, scale coverings. Some of these are really leathery, um, extensions of the exoskeleton and others like in the armored scales, for example, these white uh, scales here, they're really waxy secretions that protect the scale body. Okay, so we're, we'll, we'll take a look at that uh, next. So these protective waxes can form in the armored scales on the dorsal and ventral surface. So meaning it's protecting uh, both the back and the front of the scale, which can make them highly resistant to certain types of controls. So when we're looking at the body plan of uh, soft scales versus armored scales, this diagram does a nice job of showing that. So in the armored scales, uh, the coating or the scale itself is this, this waxy chitinous substance um, made from unsaturated hydrocarbons that the scale directly it's excretes from secretory glands that can cover both that uh, dorsal and ventral surface as well as all the eggs. Uh, so this is distinct from the body and can actually be removed in some cases to better understand the biology of the animals themselves um, or to just distinguish between, you know, is it a soft scale or a hard scale or, or an armored scale? Um, if you're able to easily remove that waxy substance, which is called the test, uh, then, you know, you can be pretty sure it's an armored scale. In the soft scales, this is actually part of the exoskeleton itself and only covers the dorsal surface uh, and not as much the ventral surface. Okay, so you can't really remove the test from a soft scale. In both, um, in both body forms or in both types here, the eggs are protected underneath that scale surface or that test, uh, which helps to prevent them being um, predated or parasitized and, and gives them some environmental protection as well. So that, that scale structure is secreted by an organ called the pygidium. So here what you're looking at is, is the basic body of a scale without the test present. Um, 
Most of the body parts have basically fused together. So the head, abdomen, and thorax are, are fused. And it really just looks like a single um, you know, piece of insect rather than having that typical sort of three-part structure. And the, this fused section in the posterior abdomen uh, near the anal opening is where the pygidial structures are located in scales. And you can see that these have a variety of openings. Here's sort of a blow up of, of what that might look like. And there's uh, lobes and secretory vessels in there that move waxy substances through microtubules and macrodocs to um, cover the body of the insect or pr provide a, a protective flap where uh, eggs and, and such will be located. Given their relatively sedentary lifestyle, uh, you'll also note that things like the antennae and the eye are greatly reduced. So most scales don't have much um, chemoreception by way of the antennae or the ability to really see or respond to predators. Uh, they're nearly blind. And in fact, some lose their eyes and later molts and become blind in their mature um, life form. So um, yeah, a very interesting and unique life history and body plan that makes them very difficult to control. So again, the, the structure that's responsible for producing that waxy secretion is called the pygidium. So when we're talking about armored scales and soft scales, um, there are several body forms that can be present in the armored scales. So they can be elongate, such as seen here with the oyster shell scale, where they're sort of long and narrow or almost perfectly circular. So as you can see in this example, uh, the soft scales tend to be more ovoid. And again, the underside of the body is not protected by this waxy excretion. So they, you can also distinguish between the two types, the armored scales and the soft scales based on just this outward physical appearance. Uh, armored scales tend to produce almost exclusively sexually. So, the typical female in her lifetime will produce, um, you know, a dozen to a hundred eggs or so, but typically not more than that. Uh, soft scales can be both sexual or parthenogenetic, meaning they can be clonal under some conditions. So uh, a female can produce an extreme amount of eggs, uh, hundreds to even thousands, or she can give birth to hundreds of. Um, to hundreds of offspring viviroparously. So uh, that can create just enormous population growth rates in some conditions, uh, making them maybe even more difficult to control than uh, the armored scales, just because of their ability to completely take over a host plant. Uh, armored scales are primarily immobile. So during that crawler stage, they, they can disperse around the body of the host plants. Whereas soft scales, uh, which don't have that ventral covering of the test, can remain somewhat mobile for most of their, their lives. So as, um, as crawlers, they're probably the most mobile, but then as adults, they can still migrate between different plant organs, um, moving between foliage and twigs or nodes as, as needed um, to, to improve feeding conditions. Here's just an example of that. A soft scale crawler from a SEM micrograph. So um, yeah, you can see that the legs are still visible, uh, whereas that's completely obscured for the armored scale. Uh, other differences uh, have to do with their life cycles. So soft scales um, are typically producing offspring twice a year. They may have two generations per year with crawlers present. Um, either in late spring and early summer. So you can see you know, two instances of, of, re, of reproductive um, flushes. And then for armored scales, usually there's only one generation per year, though in a lot of places there are also two generations per year. But it's more typical for the soft scales to have more generations per year than the armored scales. So let's talk about their development briefly. And here you can see females and males hatching from an egg. Uh, females after the crawler stage will begin to develop their protective um, covers almost immediately. By the second instar, that flap uh, protected the, for protecting egg structures can be quite large. And then by the third um, instar, you know, that's more, that development's more or less completed. 
and she will retain essentially identical morphology uh, other than growing a little bit larger in size between her immature and sexually mature stages. So they don't really change very much. Um, females tend to, to be quite similar throughout their, their life cycle. Males, on the other hand, um, oh, I guess we'll come to males in a second. Uh, here's an example of, of what might be underneath that test flap in this uh, drawing. And then of course, if you remove the flap in an armored scale, it should be full of eggs. So here, this is a female pine needle scale that has 20 to 30 eggs underneath that waxy secretion, showing the dorsal and the ventral surface. Uh, males, on the other hand, uh, can sort of go one of two ways after uh, they develop as first larvae, uh, first instar nymphs. So they may either become sessile uh, and simply feed on the body of the plant alongside with the females, or in some instances, they can develop into a pre-pupal stage uh, where they essentially form wings and then disperse to mate with females on other plants. So males typically in scale populations are infrequent and you really only see these winged morphs um, at certain times of the year when dispersal is, is uh, important. So um, in, uh, also under instances of high competition, um, you may see the development of, of winged males to disperse and form new colonies. So let's talk about uh, the feeding of scales as well. So similar to other insects in the Hemiptera, uh, like aphids and white flies, scales have piercing sucking mouth parts. And, and this is an example of what that looks like for an aphid, where um, the mouth parts are encased in these long, narrow uh, mandibular structures, and the maxilla are long, narrow muscles uh, protected within a sheath. And then they'll often pump salivary products into the plant in order to bypass some of the defenses. Uh, and produce some pre-digestion and help with the movement of plant fluids into uh, the insect body. And then that will occur through two different canals in, in the stylet. Uh, so let's just look at the, the ultra structure of the stylet, stylet briefly. So here's an example of a stylet um, that came up. And, and if you look at a cross section of that, you can see a couple of structures. Here's the feeding canal where the plant um, material would move into the body of the insect. The salivary canal, where the insect would be pumping uh, salivary proteins into the leaf surface or the bark surface. And then uh, these dendritic canals over on the sides. This is the muscle tissue. These dendritic canals are essentially where the nerves are, which allows the insect to fee, uh, feel the stylet and its movement through the intracellular spaces of the plant tissues. So like aphids, and uh, other phloem feeders, soft scales, um, uh, feed on the phloem by actually moving their stylet through the intracellular space of the sclerenchyma. So that allows them to bypass uh, a lot of plant defenses and feed directly on some of the most nutritious parts of the plant where all the photosynthate is contained. In contrast, the armored scales actually feed at the interface of xylem and phloem, um, typically in the cambial layer. So we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a minute as well. So the feeding of soft scales uh, often results in the excretion of honeydew. And um, this is in some instances more of an irritation than the scales themselves. So like for homeowners uh, who have large scale populations in their landscape trees, the secretion and production of this honeydew can be really more of a problem than the effects of the scales on, on the plants themselves. So a lot of times they, they really aren't damaging the plant very much, especially in, for example, like a mature tree, but this honeydew can get everywhere and um, can be quite a nuisance in a number of ways, uh, damaging paint on cars, on homes, uh, it can damage concrete. It can basically, you know, sort of, cause um, problems for anything it lands on. And, and such, so much so that some, um, you know, some commercial products have been developed in order to remove it specifically. It can be very difficult to remove. So if you've ever parked your car 
under a big cottonwood tree or something in the wrong time of the year, you know what this looks like. And it's, it's really a mess and really hard, hard to remove. So it's a secondary effect of the feeding uh, that can sometimes be more of an issue for people than, than the plant damage itself. Uh, another, other things that can occur that are kind of interesting is so when these scales are producing this sugary honeydew se secretion, uh, it can cause other potentially pestiferous ecological relationships to form. So here's an example where Tapanoma sessile, the odorous house ant, which is uh, ubiquitous in North America, um, will begin to tend to the scales. So you have a scale infestation in your yard. Uh, if ants start tending that and it's improving the population performance of ants, it can also prolong if, or facilitate potentially like an ant infestation in your house. Uh, side note, if you ever see these little tiny black house ants and you're not sure whether it might be Tapanoma sessile or not, you can grab them and crush them. And if you smell them and they smell like blue cheese, um, that's basically a positive ID for the odorous house ant. Another thing that can happen is um, the development of sooty molds. So that that honeydew on that can cover up, you know, leaf surfaces and bark surfaces is a sugar carbohydrate rich source and can become colonized by a variety of secondary fungi. Um, some of them like Cladosporium or Alternaria, which are plant pathogens. Others, which just are ubiquitous environmental fungi that are everywhere, can colonize the honeydew, take advantage of it as a carbon source, and may cause plant disease or uh, may cause just um, cosmetic issues with your plants because it can discolor them, make them you know, sort of not look so good. So here's an example of just sooty mold growing on a palm leaf uh, following scale feeding. Sooty mold isn't always pathogenic, but in this uh, graph, here was a study that was done just looking what happens, whether plants are stressed by uh, sooty mold or whether they're uh, unstressed by sooty mold. This is in palms, uh, looking at photosynthetic activity and total chlorophyll content. And the main takeaway here is that another secondary effect of the feeding that may not harm plant growth itself uh, can result in sooty mold colonization that disrupts photosynthesis because the pigment of the leaves are actually blocked by the fungi growing on the surface of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, leaf. So this can result in slowing of plant growth, reduction of yield, and is an aesthetic issue for homeowners. In a lot of cases, it can make your plants look ugly. Here's just an example of uh, sooty mold in a number of different places. So, you know, make sure you can make leaves uh, look dirty. Uh, here's an example from the Oval on the CSU campus, and these trees still look like this. Um, so you see this characteristic black staining that's occurred, that sooty mold that has colonized um, honeydew excretions from scale and aphid feeding that's occurred in the crown over, over many years. So it can form on the bark as well. And this is um, something we're asked about a lot. Like, what is this? Is it a fungal infection? Well, yes, uh, probably not a fungal infection that's directly damaging the tree, but it can also have structural effects in smaller branches and potentially weaken them and make them hazardous. So armor scales, in contrast, uh, really feed in this cambial layer rather than feeding directly in the phloem layer. Uh, and they feed more directly on cell contents rather than feeding in that intracellular space. So they may be more subject to plant defenses than the soft scales. Uh, here's just an example of a vascular bundle showing uh, in sunflower, showing phloem, vascular cambium between the phloem and the xylem layer here in um, a, a bundle of plant cells. So a good way to, a uh, good analogy is uh, in this example from fracking. So the armored scale uh, feeds in the cambial layer between the phloem and the xylem. And as a result, their stylet is actually perpendicular to the plant surface at the time of feeding. Uh, and that differs from the soft scale that feeds in the phloem layer and its stylet will go directly into the phloem and tends to be, um, I'm sorry, per parallel 
whereas the path of the stylet is perpendicular to the plant surface for the soft scales. So another difference just in their feeding habit, uh, something you're not gonna be able to detect with the naked eye, but it has differential effects on, um, on, on plant uh, growth as well. And you can see since this phloem layer tends to be where all the carbohydrate and photosynthate is, that, that that's why the soft scales are more of a pest in terms of producing um, honeydew and the, the secondary effects of that. So let's just briefly review what are some of the differences between the armored scale, the armored scales and soft scales. Well, uh, the body covering differs where for the soft scale, it's an exoskeleton. For the armored scale, it's a waxy covering called the test. Uh, they differ some in size. So the soft scales tend to be relatively large, greater than an eighth of an inch in size, whereas the armored scales are either elongate or perfectly circular, and they're very small, usually um, less than an eighth of an inch. So really, really tiny. Reproductive capacity differs. Armored scales can produce dozens to maybe 100 offspring in their life per female, where the soft scale can produce hundreds to even thousands. The armored scales are less mobile. Uh, both are mobile in the crawler stage, but adults of soft scales retain some amount of mobility as well. The crawler phenology in, tends to differ uh, also, where we often will see a second generation of soft scales late in the summer. But again, this is a generalization. It's not the rule. It's just a, a general pattern. Uh, they differ in their feeding behaviors. So soft scales feeding in the phloem, armored scales are feeding in the cambium. And then armored scales generally don't produce uh, extensive amounts of honeydew, whereas soft scales do. And this has a number of secondary effects. So uh, scales are highly adapted to their hosts. Uh, in fact, they were early models of coevolution with plants, and these different habits can give rise uh, to their di variable distributions of scales uh, within and between hosts. So there's a number of environmental factors that really affect them. So things like tree water potential. Uh, for many sap feeding insects, aphids and whiteflies and other sap feeding insects included, uh, when a host becomes too dry, it's actually bad for them and can cause population crashes because the osmotic potential uh, of, the, um, uh, of the plant analytes changes and makes feeding difficult and less nutritious, so more feeding can be required. Uh, there's also natural enemies that provide good control, a lot of parasitoid wasps and several beetles that can control uh, the distribution of scales. Um, tree defense chemistry can cause variation in their distribution, pathogens, including certain fungi, uh, and then their, their feeding habit. So whether they feed on many plant organs or whether they feed on one plant organ. And so that's also just a, a sort of high level difference between um, soft scales and armored scales. And then uh, and competition can also occur between Within a scale population, when it reaches very high abundance, may cause dispersal uh, or competition between other herbivores as well. So other sap feeding insects like aphids. And then simple things like dust on the plant surface can actually be detrimental to scales and prevent their ability to feed and move around on, on the plant surface. So trees on roadsides, uh, like on dirt roadsides often will have lower scale infestations because that dust provides some protection uh, against the scales as well. So let's take a look at some of the common scale insects in the Colorado Front Range. But these, again, these uh, are pretty well distributed throughout the four corner states and things like um, the San Jose scale are distributed all throughout California and the West Coast as well. So we'll talk about San Jose scale, which feeds primarily on, on plants in the rosaceae. So um, a lot of fruit trees. The oyster shell scale, which feeds on shrubs and hardwoods and is really becoming a higher profile pest insect in the four corners. And then the pine needle scale, which is ubiquitous in the Western US um, and can be a pest of conifers and a pest for homeowners. So the San Jose scale, uh, Quadrospidiotis perniciosus, the name comes from pernicious, meaning harmful in a gradual way. And this gained um, early attention from entomologists because it was damaging 
crops, uh, fruit tree crops of high value, uh, like plum, pear, apple, cherries, peaches, and even nut trees and berries. So um, this got its name, you know, from San Jose, California, uh, as well, the common name uh, where it was initially noted for being a pest of uh, fruit trees. So they can cause direct damage to fruit, which can impact the marketability of crops, um, but also large infestations can gradually over time kill a tree. And when you're talking about um, rootstock that's grafted several times and trees and rootstock become of extremely high value to these agriculturalists, that's a pretty big deal um, because rootstock can persist for a very long time. And if that's killed, by infestation uh, with scales, that's a significant loss to a grower, especially if it occurs in more than a few trees. So the San Jose scale was initially found uh, in the Rockies in 1893. It originated in Siberia and was probably moved um, via the movement of infested nursery stock and or the uh, movement of infested fruits. So here you can see an example of what it looks like uh, when it's damaged apple. So here's the scales actually on the apple surface. And if you've ever seen how an apple picking operation works, uh, you know that the people picking the apples aren't taking the time to distinguish between which apples are maybe infested and which are not. They're paid by the pound. So they fill barrels with apples as fast as they can or crates. Uh, and infection rates um, of one to two percent of the total stock can result in non-marketability of a crop. Uh, and then what that means is they can't sell it to grocers for like high value, um, you know, individual apple sales that they'll become juice apples or something like that. And, and that's a lot less valuable. So very low infestation rates uh, can actually cause significant economic damage if fruits are infested directly as opposed to the infestation of the plant body. Here's an example of a winged male. Uh, and here's an example of the sessile female protected um, under that waxy test layer. So the adult uh, female and male are yellow, but the, here's the female, you can see she, her yellow body kind of in the middle and the rest is, is covered um, by the test, which is dark gray. So this is a fairly distinctive appearance for a scale. Males are winged uh, and do most of the dispersing and movement of genetic material. And one of the challenges with the San Jose scale is that it can infest up to 200 species of tree or shrub and can feed on a wide variety of plant parts, including fruits, trunks, barks, leaves, twigs, whatever. So it's a polyphagous uh, species that can take advantage of many different parts of the plant that can be very difficult to control for that reason. The crawlers are born viviparously, meaning that they're birthed live um, and they can emerge from the back of the test at a rate of two or three per day. So each female will produce around three offspring per day. And the, to, mon to manage this species correctly, uh, integrated pest management is really the, probably the best approach which includes monitoring carefully and then applying agrochemicals or uh, control methods at the appropriate time. So um, what you wanna do is monitor both crawlers and the movement of adult males because that usually precedes the appearance of crawlers. Um, and here's an example of a trap. They're very simple. Here's just a sticky card that's been folded in half and it's had a pheromonal septum uh, just placed right in the card. And these will be placed at a density of, you know, on an orchard scale, uh, maybe every couple of meters to get really adequate coverage for monitoring the movement of males. Um, so you may have a 50 to 100 or more in an orchard if really intense monitoring is, is uh, needed. Luckily, the, the materials are fairly cheap. So the sticky cards or sticky traps are about $1 a piece. And there's a number of retailers where you can buy these loaded uh, septa that contain um, these two pheromones, which are attractive to the adult males and they're a couple of bucks a piece. So one could ostensibly do a pretty intensive monitoring um, effort for around three or $400. Here's an example of the life cycle. So 
monitoring really should occur during this entire phase when adults are present. Uh, male flight typically precedes the appearance of new nymphs and new crawlers. And this is when you're going to want to be applying um, uh, any control methods to target the crawlers if possible since they're the most vulnerable to controls and haven't developed that waxy test as strongly yet. So in Colorado, we can have up to two generations per year, even though I told you earlier that armored scales only have one generation. Uh, they overwinter as black cat nymphs, so they're about one millimeter in size, and unless you really know what you're looking for, the overwintering stages are basically impossible to find. Um, and then as soon as it's above about 50 Fahrenheit, they begin moving, feeding, uh, and developing again. So as a result, a number of biofixes have been developed that help to determine, based on the accumulation of degree days, when specific activities should take place. So if you've had a previous infestation uh, during the dormant phase, it's recommended to apply an insecticide in oil because that can help to um, have long residual lifespan and get through some of that waxy layer. Um, pheromone monitoring should be taking place uh, around 200, around the accumulation of 215 degree days, the early development of apples. Um, and then once males begin to appear, that's when you might want to start thinking about applying targeted um, chemistries for crawlers around, you know, two or 100, 300 degree days after the first crawlers are tap, trapped on sticky tape or after males are trapped, um, which in a warm summer could be not very long. Uh, that many degree days can be accumulated in just a week or so under the right conditions. So here's uh, a number of high tech sticky tape traps. Um, the general idea here is that you can monitor for crawlers quite intensively, uh, very cheaply. So using just different colors of sticky tape that's wrapped sticky side out around branches. <clears throat> um, you want to match the color of the tape that you choose to the color of the moving crawlers. So in the example of the San Jose scale where they're like yellow uh, or white as crawlers, as black tape is probably the most effective. Um, but here's an example with clear tape and white tape. So you just wanna choose the color of tape that you're using uh, to reflect high visibility um, compared to the crawler stage. So you get the idea that this is something for a couple of dollars you can put hundreds of these out and do very intensive monitoring. If any of your clients are, are you know, having commercial growing operations, uh, and that's probably the recommended first step for control is to just know where they are and when they're active, and then to be able to apply control methods at the right time. Okay, let's move on to the oyster shell scale. This is quickly becoming a, a very notable pest in Colorado uh, and in the Intermountain West because it really does a great job of infesting aspen trees, which are iconic in this region. And, uh, you know, people love aspen trees for the fall colors and they are bothered uh, when trees become heavily infested by the oyster shell skin. So you can see why it's named that. Uh, it, its appearance is somewhat like a, a oyster shell. And it has a number of common regional hosts like aspen, any hardwood, um, but it really likes aspen, alder, dogwood, and willows. So this has been nativized to the United States since about the 1700s. They're very small, two to three millimeters in size, and heavy infestation can impart a, a strange appearance to the surface of bark. And we'll, we'll look at that in just a minute, because a lot of times people find these infestations, they don't really realize what they're looking at. So here's uh, branches that are completely encrusted by the oyster shell scale. And uh, uh, a lot of times it's, they think this is a fungal infection, but it's actually insects. So if you see something strange like this, take a close look. Um, they can even remain firmly attached after the branches die. So that sort of highlights how immobile they are. Here's an example near Georgetown, Colorado of some trees that have become heavily infested with oyster shell scale. So though in addition to the direct effects of plant damage uh, and loss of photosynthate. <clears throat> uh, you can see discoloring of the bark and cracking, which can be unsightly and also create an entry court for secondary fungal infections, which can be pathogenic. 
Okay, let's talk about the pine needle scale. Um, here's a close-up view. So they have several stages present and they're a little bit bigger, three millimeters, and that with that test can reach up to eight millimeters. They're much larger and more obvious on pine needles as compared to the other two that we just looked at. Uh, males are really small and they're almost never present in Western populations. So in Western US, these are pretty much entirely clonal. Uh, here's an example of infestation. Again, often mistaken for fungal infection, but these are actually tiny insects, pine needle scales, uh, Chianaspis pinifoliae feeding on um, pine needles and spruce needles. They can infest a number of conifers, but are most common uh, really on pines. And they tend to occur in areas where pines are highly stressed, like shelter belt plantings. Um, so mugo pine and some of the other common landscape pine species, um, Austrian pine can be heavily uh, affected. In Colorado, these also have two generations per year. Here's again an example of what they look like with that test pulled back. Um, they overwinter as eggs and then hatch usually occurs April through June. Um, and the crawlers settle feeding uh, on, you know, needles and then actually lose their appendages and their eyes and later molts. So as adults, they're functionally blind. Uh, and you tend to find localized infestations. Okay. In extreme situations, so they don't usually kill trees or damage them that badly, but they're visually obvious. Um, extreme infestations can result in flagging, branch dieback, um, and, and mortality in some conditions, but it's usually associated with tree stress. But there's a number of uh, methods to control scales, and a program should consider things like natural controls, so what predators and parasitoids are present, uh, biological controls, cultural controls, chemical controls, and, and so on. So we'll go through those quickly. So natural controls uh, include a number of coccinella beetles. They're very small beetles, so they're easy to overlook. Um, and then predated scales can actually be seen through these little holes in the test. So they'll feed through that, and eat the eggs, and sometimes eat the adult as well. So here's an example of a chylocorid uh, feeding on a, on a scale. So here's a couple of the good guys uh, little tiny black beetles that range from two to four millimeters in size. Ants, as I mentioned earlier, might be something that you need to consider controlling also in conditions where there's a very large scale outbreak uh, because ants will prevent these natural enemies from feeding on the scales and can be a secondary pest in settles. So um, prior to initiating chemical controls, it's important to look for these natural controls. Parasitic wasps are extremely important control agents. And there's a number of species that are commercially available. I'll show you one in just a minute um, for a variety of pricings. So the important taxa are Aphytus malinus, which you can buy commercially quite cheaply. Coccophagus, meaning they eat coccids or coxoids like the, uh, like the scales and Metaphycus. Uh, you need to have these present for some time if you're hoping to control an outbreak, but usually uh, natural populations can will occur and are sufficient for natural control without the application of any chemicals. So you can also um, see evidence of uh, parasitoids and parasitism by these holes that will occur in the test, nice round holes where the adults have emerged. And here's a number of different uh, examples of parasitism occurring. Uh, Aphytus malinus, this nice pretty yellow parasitoid here, is uh, available um, commercially. So we'll look at that in just a moment. And again, you wanna go out and look if you notice a scale infestation for evidence of natural enemy colonization. If a lot of scales are showing uh, damaged tests like this with holes um, that are either suggestive of the presence of high predator populations or high parasitoid populations, additional control options may not be needed. Here's an example of what you get. If you try to buy a Phytus malinus, um, about 20 bucks, you can get this tuna can of tuna fish that's got 5,000 uh, little larvae in it um, that you can just sprinkle around an infestation area. And you can even buy a, a subscription if you need lots of this stuff over time. <laughs> Other Biological controls include things like um, fungal pathogens, Bovaria bassiana is somewhat promising. 
This works well on soft bodied scales because um, you can apply this stuff to the plant surface in a, in a drench or a spray. Um, it really won't work on armored scales because the test is just too protective. So here's an example of application on armored scales. You see if the test is left intact, there's essentially uh, no efficacy. If the test is removed uh, or lifted, then there is some effectiveness, but this is uh, really recommended only for soft bodied scales. And once they become uh, infested, the infection within the population will, will uh, proliferate somewhat naturally. Cultural control is also uh, promising for um, cosmetic infestations. So, you know, here's an example of an aspen tree in a yard that's covered in oyster shell scale. Again, from scale, from backed out a little bit, it's hard to tell what's going on here. So you have to take a really close look to notice them. But things like standard um, dish scrubbers or a stiff brush can work well to just remove them by brushing in a small scale or localized infestation. Um, this works great, but you have to just be careful not to go so hard that you damage the bark or the foam of the tree that you're trying to protect. Um, chemical control is also possible. There's a number of options, but we need to consider some basic principles um, before applying chemical controls. So the first is going to be timing. And again, that's where monitoring comes in using those sticky traps, using those pheromone traps to ensure that you're hitting them with whatever chemical application you want to use at the crawler stage. Otherwise, you're going to possibly have off-target effects. Uh, and off-target effects can extend beyond just natural controls. So we may impact natural enemies like those um, beetles or parasitoids with off-targets, which we don't want to do. Um, but also other beneficials, you know, if you're spraying the crown of a tree, you, you know, you may impact pollinators or, or other insects of uh, conservation concern. So improper use and improper timing um, can result in substantial off-target effects. That's a principle we need to be careful to consider. The other thing is resistance. So um, things like neonicotinoids in particular uh, can cause resistance to occur in a variety of scale insects. And once the resistance forms in a population, um, they pretty well stay resistant and integrated control using carefully timed applications essentially becomes impossible. So um, over-application or incorrect application can lead to worse problems than you had before. And then specificity. So some things will work well on armored scales, some will work well on soft body scales, some on both. But if you, imply, you, know, if you try to apply Bovaria, Botanigard uh, to control armored scales, it's not gonna be effective. So you have to understand those subtle differences in biology in order to choose the right uh, control method. So let's just take a look at, at a few of those. Um, here, I've, I've got a couple of different products listed, some notes and what they're effective against. So many things will be uh, effective against both armored and soft scales. Neonex really aren't recommended, um, but they can work against soft scales. The Dinotefron is probably um, one of the ones that I would recommend as well as the Pyroproxifen mainly because soil application is going to allow you to avoid a lot of off-target effects. But again, as a neonic, uh, you could have some problems. Pyroproxifen is nice because it doesn't tend to impact those natural enemies that we're concerned about um, managing for control. Okay, so there's a number of things that will work. I, um, you know, any of these will be okay, but Things with long residual contact times and high toxicity uh, you want to avoid. So I'm about to show you a graph, um, which basically says that bifenthrin isn't something you should really use. So some studies were done uh, to look at these different chemistries and their effects on off targets or um, control of selected armored soft scales. So at the top, in this top panel, you're looking at the effects of those chemistries on the abundance of parasitoids, on the abundance of predators. Uh, bifenthrin knocked back the predators uh, and parasitoids quite a bit, uh, particularly the parasitoids were really heavily affected by the bifenthrin. Uh, the, the predators, the beetles didn't care as much and were more resistant 
um, to, to all of these applications. But in general, the dinotefiron gave the highest overall yield of predators or reduced or parasitoids, reduced parasitoids the least and didn't have an effect on predators. So um, that would be one of the ones I would probably like to see um, or the pyrocroxifen. So bull tree sprays uh, aren't generally recommended because they produce surface residues, which can then end up in the soil as um, leaves or foliage are lost. You know, even conifers will lose third and fifth year needles. Um, this also often results in the destruction of natural enemies and high off target effects. So whenever possible, treatment should really be limited uh, to the lower area of the trunk or bark to minimize those impacts on natural enemies. Here's just an example of what that type of spray uh, might look like. So again, eliminating it to the lower bark when possible and utilizing natural controls, uh, and cultural controls and high monitoring ahead of the need for chemical applications uh, will help you maintain a more sustainable system, more sustainable method of pest management. Uh, so with that, I'll stop. Uh, here's some additional resources that will be available. Um, that you will be available to follow up with from the presentation. And if we have time, I'll, uh, I'll take a few questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Davis. I um, appreciate your knowledge as always, and you always have the best photos. Um, a couple of just quick comments. I know we've got a lot of arborists on the call. So um, some of the stuff utilizing, I think we're doing a better job utilizing some of our more eco-friendly products that are out there, kind of getting some of the biocontrols as part of our, our systems, which is really great. Um, and definitely a quick mention on the pyroproxman is great. We see really good results on um, utilizing that product so we're not damaging the beneficials. We're being really mindful of our pollinators, you know, an opportunity that we sometimes do have to lean on a way to but um, really efficacious. And then the one thing to know too is we haven't seen a ton of resistance, um, but there has been a couple of cases here and there. So, okay. So a couple of questions coming through. One, uh, to submit your arborist credits to get to use, you need to type your name and your SA number into the Q&A if you did not do it when you signed up. If you already signed up and did that, you don't need to do it again. So um, that is done. Um, Alrighty, so questions coming in for you. Uh, one, if dry conditions are bad for scale populations, should you advise homeowners to stop irrigation until you gain control of the infestation? I think we'd wanna add irrigation. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Um, I would generally not recommend ceasing irrigation. Um, you know, that's going to, the dehydration and drought stress is probably going to result in more plant damage than the feeding itself. Um, scale feeding most of the time on mature trees is not really going to harm the tree that much, uh, unless you're managing, you know, a, a, an apple orchard or unless that, uh, uh, honeydew is really becoming a significant secondary problem. So typically I wouldn't recommend, uh, ceasing irrigation. Yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, just to piggyback, sorry not to take your Q&A, but um, yeah, if drought is a concern, that's only going to make the exacerbate the situation. So you want to make sure that you're managing the cultural side of things, because a lot of times skills in the ornamental world come in as a secondary thing anyway. And we do see really bad outbreaks that do actually kill, you know, pretty big branches on trees if we let them get bad enough. So definitely try to mitigate. Okay. Uh, another question is, I've heard on traps can actually bring in more pests and should only be used for monitoring, but not for control. Is that true for scales or do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I do have comments on that. So that, that is true under for very specific types of insects. So things like uh, bark beetles, which have highly effective pheromones as well, we can bring in enough insects that they may be getting attacking uh, trees around the trap, called the halo effect. That's not something you want to see. Um, for scales, those pheromones are so highly evolved that really not many other things other than predators and parasitoids, which eavesdrop on those pheromones, uh, will pick up on. So I wouldn't be concerned about that for scales or most agricultural pests. It's more the forestry pests that have general um, 
uh, have more general pheromones that are a concern. So things like bark beetles. Cool. All right. Do you know if the pine tree that is frosted in appearance and can accidentally be identified as? I don't. Uh, my guess is that's some that some weird, good. weird varietal. Uh, okay. So um, I'm a couple of these that are coming in. One, when do you recommend applying um, to the gate scales? That is going to be dependent on, like Seth already said, the growing degree day and emergence of those crawlers. So you got to look up the stuff that you're dealing with and then. Um, look at your growing degree calendar where you live. We don't have an exact answer on that. You have to do a little bit of research. Um, and sorry, in the name of time. Oh, okay. Can you hear me right now? You're, you're so breaking up a little. You can hear me. Okay. Oh, shit. You're, you're okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then we've got, sorry, in the name of time, I know we've got to get off here. So do oyster shells get, uh, Oyster shell scale emergence before or after pine needle scale? I guess we'll have to look up. Um, I think they probably are similar timing. Uh, most of these scales are going to become active once the air temperatures exceed about 50 or 55 Fahrenheit. So it'll be fairly similar. Probably, if I were going to make a guess, I would say that the pine needle scales would be a little delayed just because they're going to be in forest conditions, which are typically a little cooler. Cool. Okay, the last one, is there any good biogranolia skill that you know of? Uh, the only really good commercially available um, fungal control is that Botanicard, but those uh, purchasing the parasitoids, the, the tuna fish can of parasitoids will also work well. You just may need to repeat that several times to get natural control um, started. Okay, cool. Um, oh, Jeff Beecham says, frosted pines are the bristlecone pines that have resin on the needle. That's a helpful be mistake. Okay, so we need to jump off to offer attention. I reckon um, right at that time. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to anyone here. Let me pull up the CEU code for your record.